Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Weekly is brought to you by, of course, MyBookie.ag. So if you want to bet on the fights tomorrow night, which I'm sure John will have the latest update on the odds for us, go to thegruelingtruth.net, click on the MyBookie.ag banner, go bet the fights. Uh, I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I want to welcome in my co-host. First up, Jeremiah Pricer. Mike, 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 Mike. Hey, how's it going? You're supposed to say good evening. Um, and I, next up, no, do you blew it. John Einreinhofer. How you doing, John? Good, Mike. I'm having a happy day. I've got Deontay Wilder weighing in at 214, so I'm, I'm, I'm in a content mood tonight. Well, we'll talk about that last. Um, obviously, he's malnourished. Um, first up, we're going to talk about Kel Brook against uh, Sahari Rebel, whatever, whatever you have to say. You can call him Sergey. Yeah, Rob, Rob Chanka. How about that? Is that close? It's close. Close enough. I have a feeling you only have to remember his name for tonight, Mike, and you won't have to remember it anymore. <laughs> well, I won't have to remember it. I just have to say it tonight. But it, it's for, of course, the WBC Silver Welterweight, Super Welterweight Championship. I mean, that's that's pretty significant right there when you're fighting for a silver championship. Uh, of course, Brooke has only fought twice in, what, the last three years? Yeah, he got stopped by Golovkin. He got stopped by Errol Spence. Uh, when you look at Rabchenka, or however you say his name, um, there's not a lot here. Uh, he lost by TKO to Tony Harrison. Uh, lost a split decision to Anthony Mundine in 2014. Does have a win over Bradley Price. But unless Kell Brook has really fell off the map in, over the last couple of years, I think this is a fight we can safely assume Brook will take care of business, don't you think, John? Yeah, I think that this is just a fight. Uh, and, you know, being fair to Kell Brook, uh, you know, Golovkin and Spence back-to-back is about as tough as you can get. Uh, I, I have to give the guy credit in hindsight for that. Uh, you know, and, and to some degree at the time. But why I mention it is, now we're at the point where, you know, for WBC silver super welterweight title aside, and of course I'm being sarcastic. Uh, this is just a fight being brought back where hopefully a guaranteed win for him, you know, for his people, he's a, he's a minus 18, 10 favorite. Uh, you know, Rabichenko is plus 1005. So that tells you everything you need to know right there. It's a mismatch. Um, and, you know, it's just really what is this fight about is just what you said, Mike, is because you never know after the beatings Brooke took against Golovkin and Spence, you know, it's does Brooke have anything left? And his people obviously have that concern too, be, because of who they're bringing him in back against. And, you know, I, I think the career, the career trajectory for Brooke and, and being fair to him, he, he took those two very, very difficult fights and, uh, you know, lost both decisively. You give him credit for taking the risk, especially the Spence. You know, but well, both fights, you can argue he really didn't have to take. Uh, so you got you got to give him some credit there. But with all that said, uh, I've seen this coming really, you know, since the Spence loss. And, and I think Rabichenko reflects this. I, I don't think you're going to be seeing Kel Brook on a very dangerous career track from here on out. He, something had to be taken out of him after those two beatings. And I, I think my guess is he's just being targeted at this point for a Liam Smith fight, which they can make big in, uh, in you know, Great Britain, especially if Liam Smith is able to uh, get by uh, Sodom Ali and pick up the alphabet belt again. And apparently they're going to fight on May 12th by all indications on HBO in the United States. I figure that's what he's being targeted for. You know, Smith's not a big puncher. doesn't have any huge victories. So that would be a natural to me there. I saw uh, Jermel Charlo uh, on Twitter. I think it was even today saying he might want to fight Brooke. I, I can't see Brooke taking that at this point. I, I think he'd take a beating. And uh, I figure that, you know, um, um, Khan's coming back. I would that would not shock me either. I think that that fight probably makes some sense for both men considering where they're at in their career to cash out with the payday with lower risk in terms of taking damage. So I don't, I don't think we're going to see Kel Brook in any kind of fight anywhere near 
uh, what he took against Golovkin and Spence the rest of the way. Yeah, I I tend to believe that also. Jeremiah, what's your take on Brooke? And I, I think if he does want to get to that point, that he needs to be extremely impressive here. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, I I think John just about covered all the bases here. I mean, Rob Chenko is a guy that I've I've actually followed for a little while now because he's being trained by Ricky Hatton, and uh, you know I figured he can compete. You know, not quite at a world class level, and he proved that against Tony Harrison. I mean, to me, Harrison is a fringe contender at best. Uh, you know, he he was fairly competitive early on, uh, but then he was overwhelmed late. Uh, so I think this is a good, you know, get back in the groove kind of fight for Kell Brook. Uh, you know, unless his eye socket, you know, is, is, is you know, he's just got too much nerves about it. I, I don't suspect that he'll he'll lose this fight. Uh, but I, I agree. I mean, if he wants to. But really, it doesn't matter. I mean, if, even if he's not that impressive and Liam Smith beats Saddam Ali, he's getting that fight. I mean, if actually if Kell Brook looks less impressive uh, that might give Liam Smith some confidence because, uh, you know, Liam Smith isn't really – he's not much of a world beater either in my opinion. But with 154 thinning out, you know, you with the uh, one of the Charlo brothers jumping up and Entrada jumping up, you know, there's there's some hope for, for guys like Smith and, and Brooke, <clears throat> you know, especially – well, and even if Saddam Ali happens to defeat – uh, Liam Smith, I, you know, I, I think that would be a good fight for Kell Brook too. You know, Ali's a good boxer, but Brook can hit a little bit, you know, so I think there's a chance that he gets that fight either way. But uh, he's, he's, you know, really likely to win this fight. I think that he will look impressive. I think his confidence will come back enough against a guy like Rob Chanko to, to put on a fairly good performance and he'll move on. And, and again, you know, John was right. I, I think the, the Smith fight is where it's at. Makes a lot of sense. We'll see where he goes after that. All right. Now, next up, we have a rematch. Andre Durrell against Jose used a guy. Uh, it was a DQ in the eighth round. But I think the thing that stood out to most people was used a guy getting punched in the face by Leon Lawson after Durrell had just lost or just won on a disqualification. Um, this fight, I think, Jeremiah, Durrell's career is on the line here. He has to look good. He has to get this guy out. He, he's got to do something here. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, Darrell is one of those guys who, honestly, it feels like he's been around forever, hasn't it? I mean, he he was in the Super Six. You know, people seem to forget that. I mean, he's been, and that was what two thousand four. Uh, you know, my timeline might might be a little yeah, off that was there. Two thousand nine, I think, wasn't it? Two thousand eight. Uh, I don't know. You might be right. I could, I could be way off there. You know, yeah, the thing is, I don't even think he turned. I think he turned pro in two thousand and five. Uh, okay, yeah, you're right. My timeline's off there, but yeah, it feels like he's been around forever. You know, that's almost a decade ago. I mean, Durrell is one of those guys who came out of the amateurs. He had a good amateur background. I mean, he was good there. Uh, you know, and it felt like he was going to be something, but he's wasted his potential. Uh, I don't know if it's bad management. I don't know if it's, it's his attitude. It's hard to say. I mean, I'm not involved. Uh, you know, with his camp, I'm not rubbing, rubbing elbows with his manager or his promoter. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but. It's it's been a big turnoff to watch him maneuver his career this way because a lot of us were hoping, you know, when Andre Ward won the Super Six, there weren't very many people around. I mean, Lucien Boutte and Andre Durrell were about the only two we thought, you know, might have been able to give Andre Ward some sort of a test uh, after the tournament was over. Uh, but now here he is against a guy like Ustagai, and and uh, you know that fight was real, real close uh, the last time. Uh, and I'm hoping who's the guy will get it together and actually he'll bring the fight to Darrell. Uh, you know, Darrell, for me, he feels that he just feels like at one point he's going to get upset by a guy like who's guy again with the, the inactivity, uh, you know, the lack of dedication, who's the guy, an aggressor, a go getter. He feels like the type who can go and get Darrell out of there. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that's what happened. You know, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's it's been a, it's become a bit tiresome seeing the Durrells get all sorts of title shots and you know if they're not in title shots they're not doing anything to to earn title eliminators which I I think this fight is uh, you know it, it's again it's just become a bit tiresome uh, I actually I'm picking who's the guy to win uh, by stoppage late in this fight because again I you know I just feel like Durrells the hourglass is going to round round out at some time and I'm hoping it's this time. Yeah, and who's the guy, I think is the guy, no pen intended, that's going to pretty much put an end to Darrell's career tomorrow night. What's your take on that, John? 
<laughs> that's actually the direction I'm leaning in as well. Uh, what are the odds on right, was now? Sort of, right now? Right uh, now, it's mybookie.ag. It's Ustatagi uh, is a minus 200, and Darrell's at plus 170. And the first oh, one, wow. my recollection is that Darrell was a slight favorite. It was the opposite. Uh, so the odds makers have made an adjustment based on what they saw in that first fight. And you have to pay attention to these. Yeah, because things. I thought it was the guy was winning the fight when it was stopped. Yeah, I, I thought he w- it was starting to go his way. Yeah, Darrell has, uh, you know, I agree with Jeremiah's synopsis in the sense that Darrell's had a bizarre career. Uh, let, let me just, I guess, take what might be his side of the story uh, for a moment that, that I think is, is somewhat of a realistic interpretation too. Uh, you know, he, he fought Frosh in the super six. I, I did think he got robbed in that fight. Uh, and Frosh ended up, you know, being a, being a pretty good, well-respected fighter, of course, as we know, by the time his career was done. And then, you know, he had the next round match against Abraham where you had that bizarre, uh, you know, disqualification thing when Darrell got hit when he was down and Abraham was a pretty good puncher at that time. And, you know, it, it was, it was reminiscent of course, what just happened this last time, you know, at that time you, you were looking, he definitely got hit when he was down, but you know, the people were questioning, uh, you know, how, how hurt, how hurt was he, what happened, but there were legitimate reports after that, that uh, he had a lot of post concussion syndromes after that had trouble recovering from that. And if I recall the incident correctly, I think he, he did get hit on the back of the head. Um, but, but, you know, he came back um, really, again, as Jeremiah was saying about the way his career went, you know, not, not, nothing much then for a while. Then when P, PBC was uh, first getting off the ground, uh, he ends up in what ended up being an entertaining to fight, fight with James DeGale. He gets dropped twice early and then shows a lot of heart fighting hard the rest of the way to get back into the fight, loses a close decision. Probably the problem for him, though, is that the Gale hadn't been, hadn't been knocking too many people down after that, except, uh, you know, Badu Jack and their brawl. And, uh, you know, the Gale now we can look back in hindsight and, and he hasn't uh, proven to be what we thought he might be. So why I say that is Darrell's loss there when he got dropped twice, even though he fought tough and it was an entertaining fight, is not looking all that great in hindsight. And then, you know, he, 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 tur- he really fights a couple of guys. Like, I think he was in with Caparillo. And, uh, you know, no, nobody high, high on anybody's radar screen. And he ends up in this fight with, with Eustace, the guy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's close. But it uh, looks like Eustace, the guy, might, might be taking a lead in the fight. We get another bizarre uh, after-the-bell type incident and uh, ends up with his uncle uh, jumping into the ring and, and hitting – uh, used the guy, uh, total, total, you know, really a criminal assault there. And so he's peripherally involved in that. And, you know, here we are in the rematch, I believe technically, if you, you care about the alphabet stuff, which I don't, I think ridiculously, this is for the, I, I believe it was for the IBF interim title. Yeah. Uh, why nobody knows, nobody knows, but, um, nobody even knows I, what I, an interim I, title I, is John. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah, no I interims anymore. Yeah. Right. I don't care to because uh, the, you know this this idea that you've got to put an alphabet belt on every fight. And what's better to be an so. interim champion or a silver champion? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I really, can, who knows? And then, defi- and then define the difference to me, and then define the difference between you know being having the WBC diamond belt. I mean, uh, you know, Is whatever. There a goal? I think that I, I, I'm, yeah, I am. Well, I think it's that. obvious still- that the diamond belt would be more expensive, so that's probably the most important. Yeah, it's just absolutely crazy. But getting back to this fight, at least it's, an, it's, it's a somewhat intriguing matchup. Uh, East the guy is crude, but he has legit power. Uh, it's still close to me, but I do concur with uh, both of you that uh, Jeremiah and I had speculated before the first fight. I think we saw it coming because it did look that way to some degree with up to this bizarre ending that, that it could be the end of the, the line for Durrell. But if you want to call that an escape, the last time he escaped. Uh, but I think this probably is the end of the line for him. And and it will go down as a career of, of more of a what what might have been than, than what actually happened. And, and, you know, even if he pulls down what would be an upset and gets the IBF interim belt, I mean, you know, so then you call yourself a world champion there. But it's just, again, all these belts are just 
self parody. It's nothing against Andre Durrell. He's shown me flashes in his career, but it's been very, very inconsistent. And like Jeremiah said, it seems like he's been around forever. And uh, I think the hourglass is probably going to be up tomorrow night. And I'll, I'll have to, you know, I'm not dodging any pick. I, I, it's still close to me, but I'll have I'll have, I'll lean towards uh, use the guy in this one as well, and it'll probably be the end for Andre Durrell. All right, now we're going to go to the other card, um, which I think is at the Madison Square, Square Garden Grand Theater. Uh, Sergey Kovalev against Igor Mikulkin. I believe that's Kali Mikulkin's son, or son. Not sure about that, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that's what Jeremiah told me. Um, I, I don't think there's much to be said about this fight, guys. Uh, I think it's going to be over quickly. I mean, Igor McCallan or McCallan or whatever his name is, he's 21 and one. But the thing that stands out is he's only got eight or nine knockouts. He doesn't have the power. You look at his last 10 fights, almost everything there is a UD unanimous decision. So I, I think John, it's safe to say that Kovalev will walk through him rather quickly. Yeah. I think you make a good point, Mike, because, uh, I don't like I don't like the way it's played out generally with uh, fighters not having the way in the day of the fight with the way they end up coming in heavier, but uh, in the light heavyweight division I think it's had an indirect interesting effect which I've mentioned it before but I think it's always worth mentioning. Now these guys coming into the ring 185 or more, uh, if you read neurologists, uh, the experts on the subject. You know, any, any human being 185 pounds or more can deliver enough force to the chin of another human being to knock them out. It, it changes at about that weight. And and you look at these light heavies today, uh, they're punching like, like you know, heavyweights from uh, 50 years ago. Uh, in other words, you know, you, you've got to take it like you used to take the heavyweights. I mean, anybody can get knocked out. You, be, you better have a chin and you, you better bring some power and why I'm saying all that is because McCalkin does not. He's got the decent win over Oosthausen, but he's had PED issue. Uh, Mahalkin has had PED issues too. He was on the melodium, uh, like a lot of the Russian athletes are, and you know had had some excuse for it. Like uh, there, there's always you know almost all these guys when they take it, there's always an excuse, you know, or, or women in in tennis, and uh, he he was he was one of them. So he's here, but he doesn't have knockout power, and he's going against a power puncher in Kovalev. Uh, you know, I, I don't think a, a light hitter is going to uh, do it against Kovalev. You could say, well, Andre Ward's not a big puncher, but Andre Ward uh, punched with authority in their second fight. And, Andre uh, Ward can hit. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he, he, he can, he's kind of proven he can hit when he wants to, and exactly, that was that's my point there. So this guy can't. He's he's plus ten fifty. Kovalev's minus nineteen hundred. I'm giving HBO a pass on this fight just because I know legitimately, uh, and they're both with main events. They 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 wanted this to be Kovalev Barrera, and Barrera just did not want Kovalev, uh, despite the fact that he was offered more money for the fight, and he doesn't. Nobody disputes that. So I'm, I'm giving HBO a little bit of pass because they tried to pick the best matchup they could. And then they they made a very good fight on the undercard, Bivol and Barrera, which of course we'll get to. So uh, I'm just giving a little bit of a pass for the circumstances of how this one came up. You know, main events doesn't have the depth where it's easy for them to to get opponents, and you know they're they're Kovalev's promoter, so they they tried their best. Uh, that would have been a one or two one versus two matchup in transnational would have been the same for me. For me, it would have been a lineal title vacancy filler but you know Barrera didn't want it so we're stuck with this and I just don't see uh what Mahalkin has for Kovalev so he, sh- he should be able to stop the guy because as you alluded to Mike the guy's got a pop gun to try to hold him off with and Kovalev's got a bazooka and that should uh, take care of business pretty quickly in this one which is good because it's going to uh, uh as everybody's channel flipping from Showtime to HBO at least it'll uh, reduce our conflicts at that point yeah, because I would rather just watch the Bavol Barrera fight and go straight to Ortiz and Wilder. Um, I assume, Correct. Jeremiah, you agree with us on this one? No, not at all. I think you guys are way off base so, here. No, of course. You really no, no, of course. McCulkin is going to be Kovalev? <laughs> no, no, of course. No, he's no. I don't. I don't believe yes, that. Yes, you I mean, do. You just said it. <laughs> uh oh, we're going to hold this one against me. No, I have to. Uh, 
I, I think John's right. I mean, if you don't have power or if you don't have a lot of ring IQ like Andre Ward did, it, it, you, you're going to have a tough time beating Kovalev. Kovalev looks to me like the best light heavyweight in the world pretty clearly at this point. I mean, it, yeah, you know, Bivol, you know, Beater Biv, all these other guys. Yeah, you know, maybe they look like they got potential. But in terms of, you know, tools and what they've been able to prove, the fact that Kovalev was able to hang and arguably beat Andre Ward in the first fight is is enough for me to to know, you know, that he it, right now is the best light heavyweight in the world. You know, again, like John said, if you if you don't have power, it, it's it's not going to do it. So what I see is is a boxing match. Kovalev has been there; he's done that. Uh, again, he was able to box with Ward. Uh, I, I just don't see anywhere Mahalkin is going to win. Uh, he looks pretty good so far. Um, you know, he's got, he's got a few nice wins under his belt. He stepped up quickly, uh, you know, but he's just overmatched here. And, uh, you know, again, that, that's all good and well, you know, it's not Kovalev's fault that he's getting him, uh, you know, I'm sure he would have preferred to fight Barrera, uh, Michael Montero, who, you know, his, his materials posted on our website. He did, he did an interview with Sergey Kovalev not long ago and they asked him about fighting the very best. He, you know, he was like, let's get it on. And, and to his credit, they, they asked him about the whole, uh, or Montero asked him about the whole, um, you know, multiple titles thing. And Kovalev said, I, you know, I wish there was only one world championship, you know, they're almost in uh, George Foreman like way. He was like, you know, there's one world, there should be one world championship. And they also asked him if, you know, there was a super series at 175, whether he would participate. And he said, yeah, absolutely. So uh, that would be fantastic to see that. And I wouldn't be surprised if they could pull that off, seeing as so many of the top 175 pounders are uh, of European descent. Uh, you know, could we get a Donna Stevenson in there? And, eh, you know, I don't know. But then again, maybe he doesn't beat Badu Jack. Uh, but, yeah, this is a win for him. He'll move on. Hopefully he goes back to his old uh, work rate of fighting three, four times a year. I think that'd be good. You know, you know, blasting out guys like Mahalkin and uh, Shabransky. When you're doing that sort of stuff, you should get in the ring pretty quickly. And Kovalev was doing that before. Uh, hopefully he gets back on that. And hopefully he fights the winner of uh, Bivol Barrera. All right. And the reason I wanted to do this show, even we did Water Ortiz earlier in the week. So no, it's not just because me and John like to argue about it. Because it's Let's face it, we're going to argue about this for the next year anyways, probably. Uh, but is the Sullivan Barrera, Dimitri Bivol fight. Um, Bivol's a guy that a lot of people think is the real deal here. Um, he beat Trent Broadhurst. He beat Cedric Agnew. He's not fought anywhere near the level of competition that Sullivan Barrera is. Um, so when you look at this, I think Barrera's only loss, of course, was to Andre Ward by unanimous decision. Um, beat Felix Valera, I think unanimous decision, same way that Bavol beat him. Um, of course, he won a unanimous decision against Joe Smith. Um, my question is this. We'll start off with Jeremiah. When I look at this, I mean, outside of the Andre Ward loss, and maybe Joe Smith, I mean, the competition level for Barrera is not like it's been real good. And I, I'm not one of these guys that really buys that he's that good. When I, when I look at the competition, he beat Valera by a unanimous decision, Joe Smith by a unanimous decision, he TKOs Paul Parker, he beats Shabransky, he loses to Ward. Um, to me, there's not a lot here where I really understand why people think that he's that good. Well, I mean, probably because he, you know, he's been on the deck for the last five fights, and he's been able to box pretty well against them. You know, he's he's overcome all those. But uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think outboxing Joe Smith Jr. is indicative of him being some world beater. Uh, you know, Joe Smith had his flaws going in, and Joe Smith Jr.'s, you know, best win was an old Bernard Hopkins. So, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's something to take out of it. But uh, yeah, again, you kind of got to project project a little uh, against technically sharper and you know bigger hitters guys like Bivol and and Kovalev and um, you know the win against Parker and Valera yeah they weren't special but the, those guys were pretty good um, you know the, the Ward fight he was clearly out boxing but then again it's you know it, it probably helped him learn because Ward is a savvy guy you know and seeing as both Barrera had never fought on the the level before um, I imagine he he learned a few things in that bout, but yeah, it's it, it's tough. I mean, this but that's modern boxing. I mean, there 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 are just so many times where you have to project 
how styles are going to play out. I mean, look, look at all the guys. You know, I'm a big fan of these Eastern European guys. I mean, you know, I've been following them. Uh, you know, I wrote an article on Yuri Arbachikov. You know, we're talking early 90s here. You know, I've, I've enjoyed their style for many, many years. But, you know, it, it does seem like we have to pr- pump the brakes on Bivol as well because, you know, Trent Broadhurst is not – a world beater either. And, you know, by the way, he took the punch. He's, he's, you know, he's, I'm not saying he's chinny, but it isn't granite. So I, I think that's what adds interest to the equation because Bivol's young, uh, especially for an Eastern European. I believe he had 200 plus amateur fights. Uh, you know, Barrera has looked good. He certainly fought the better opposition than, than Bivol, but it, it's interesting because both are technically very good. Um, but with Barrera's chin and Bivol's power, I, th- I think that's where it makes the difference. Uh, you know, I, I do think that Bivol, uh, you know, he fought in the world, uh, world um, uh, the WSB, which, you know, guys like Lamachenko, Adevrachenko had participated in beforehand. Uh, so I, I think, you know, when he came into the pros, he was better prepared than most anyways. And I think that we will find out that he is on that level. And I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a knockout against Barrera, and that's what I'm going to pick, actually. I, th- I think he scores a late stoppage. Yeah, I think a late stoppage or a decision victory. Um, Jeremiah, or John? Yeah, uh, I, I think this is, you know, Wild Ortiz is extremely interesting. This fight's extremely interesting. Of all the fights signed this year, these were, are two of my favorites. Um I've been shocked personally at how big of an underdog Barrera has been. Um, he's at plus 520 on mybookie.ag and Bivol's uh, minus 740 uh, on one of the other sites. I saw tonight Barrera went up to a plus 620. Um, I think Barrera is the second best light heavyweight in the world after Kovalev. Uh, my only reservations here are his age, 36, and the fact that He's been dropped against Jabransky. He's been dropped against Ward. Been dropped against Smith. Been dropped against Valera. Uh, you know, he, he, he's fighting a good puncher in, in Bivol. His chin's got to hold up, and he's got to not get old in one night. I, I do have those concerns, but he hasn't shown that to me yet. Uh, even when he's hit the canvas, he hasn't been in trouble. Uh, even though there, there's been those four knockdowns there, they've they've all been flash types. He's he's immediately responded. And in all the fights except uh, for the Ward one, he's come back not only to win, he's come back to dominate. Uh, they have the common opponent in Valera. Uh, you know, Brera went down against him. Uh, Bivol didn't, but uh, they both uh, won clear-cut decisions. Uh, and then Barrera's fought the better guys. I, I think for today's boxing, with how weak resumes general are, generally are and how much projecting you've got to do, I think – uh, Barrera's resume is very good. Uh, when you when you've been in the ring with Andre Ward, who's the best uh, pound for pound fighter in the world, uh, you're in the ring with Joe Smith Jr., who's one of the best uh, punchers in boxing. Uh, you're in the ring uh, with Chabransky, who's undefeated, and in that fight, Barrera went in. I think he was a, uh, a minus three hundred underdog going into that fight, and he just dismantled Chabransky. Yeah, I think Shabransky's it was the beating that broke. Yeah, Shabransky, I think he, he is, he's, I think Shabransky's pretty good, Mike, but I think he took a bad yeah. beating against Barrera. And, uh, you know, he had, he had defensive vulnerabilities, but he wasn't the same after that. And uh, that was a heck of a fight, a heck of a brawl. But Barrera just, just really pounded him and showed his skill level in that fight. Uh, so I, I think, you know, when you look at what he has been in, Paul Parker's a, a kind of a dangerous spoiler type even though he's a, he's also a you know club fighter journeyman type but he's he's got some pop and uh you know burr just had had that as a fill-in fight so uh you know it, as long as he's not getting old in one he's he's impressed me he's he's totally convinced me he's for real i got him number two after Koval have in the division uh transnational assuming that they've just got stevenson as champion because they believe he's still got the right lineal claim and they don't really believe he's the one or two light heavyweight in the world. Uh, I agree with their ranking where they have uh, Kovalev one and Barrera two. That's the way I have it in our rankings, my original eight rankings for the grueling truth as well. Uh, the ring has Barrera lower, so maybe they concur with you, Mike, uh, their panel. I, I totally disagree with that, especially with what Barrera has done and how he looked. Uh, it's very. I, I totally respect uh, the odds makers' judgment because they know 
better than us. Uh, and unless you have inside information, it's very hard to uh, go against the odds makers. I can't say I have inside information, but I would try to use a little bit of inside logic to say that I see an upset here, which would be this. I would say that Sullivan Barrera, uh, you know, got offered the Kovalev fight. Uh, he was offered more money than, than for Bivol. Didn't want the fight. Doesn't dispute that himself. Okay. He's selecting Bivol. Okay. Barrera himself uh, has the most on the line. It's his career, uh, how he's going to make money. He's got the most to gain. So he has to he has to make a good judgment there. He's got more incentive than anybody in the world to make that judgment right. He's looking at Bivol and saying, I can beat this guy, okay? Uh, Bivol, I think, is good. I'm not down on him at all. He's legit top 10 to me. Uh, I don't have any problems with him, except that, uh, you know, he's not – He's had a good amateur career, but he's not quite as decorated as some of the uh, guys we might be used to seeing. And I think people might be making an assumption there that's a little off. Uh, and I think even in his wins, he's looked a little mechanical. And look, he's got the one-round KO against Broadhurst. Let, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but it's a generalization worth making. Let, let's face it. The, the Australians have not had uh, threatening fighters since the days of Jeff Fennick and Jeff Hardy. Uh, you know, when they when they face international competition and, and, you know, you know, they go outside of Australia, they don't they don't perform well. Uh, so, you know, the, the broad first thing, because some kind of alphabet things are involved, you know, belts, whatever. So, you know, so so what? So, you, you know, he knocked him out in one round. And a lot of people see it on YouTube. And I think they think, you know, my God, this guy's a, a, a fearsome destroyer. Look how he just dismantled this broad horse guy. In one, so I don't look at that. I do look at you know he he knocked out Samuel Clarkson, who's a guy that people don't know about, who is very dangerous and brings a good power, and he, he blew Clarkson away. That that impressed me. Uh, that was worthy of note to me. Agnew doesn't mean anything to me. Agnew's known for getting knocked out by Kovalev, and if he wouldn't have got knocked out by Kovalev, there's there's nothing of note about Cedric Agnew. Uh, you know that he just popped up uh, against Kovalev on HBO and got blown out, and uh, so you know to me when Bivol blew him out. That just didn't really mean anything to me. So the Clarkson thing did, uh, but Broadhurst and Agnew, not not so much. So we're looking at the common opponent, Valera, but they both perform similarly against him. I think if Barrera doesn't get old, uh, you know, again, it, it's tricky when you're talking about money, but if somebody wants an underdog shot, I can't think that they're going to get a better underdog shot this year than plus 520 or plus 620 on Barrera. I'm going to pick him to win. Uh, I think it'll probably be a decision, but uh, if Pereira's still got something left in the tank at 36, I don't think it's even impossible that he he stops him. But I, I think that's got to be one of the best shots at an upset pick this year of, for somebody who wants to get good odds. So I, I'm going to pick Pereira. I was going to pick him anyway, but if somebody looking for an underdog shot, even if it doesn't work out, uh, don't blame me later because I can't see much of a better shot you're going to get this year than a plus 520 on Pereira here. All right, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> what are you well, doing yeah, over there, Jeremiah? What do, you, what do you mean? I mean, he already asked me my opinion on this I fight. No, I just wanted to see if you had anything. If I, mean, I, well, if I wanted... To me, when I look at this, I mean, Badu Jack, I would rank above Sullivan Barrera. He's beaten better competition. Well, I mean, if you're ranking the original eight, I can certainly see that. But, I mean, the thing about... Uh, well, that's what John does, so that's why I brought that up. Right. Who, who, I, I don't. I don't see how. I don't see how Jack's beaten anywhere better competition than uh, Anthony Pereira's Durrell, beaten. George Groves, Lucian Butte, James DeGale. Right. No. No. No problem taking Barrera's uh, competition over that. Really? Even though he has no competition, he fought Joe Smith. He fought Andre Ward, Mike. He lost to Andre Ward. Yeah. I, I don't. Well, I don't think ring, when you get in the ring with out, Andre Ward. Would you get shut out? And, uh, he won't get in a ring with a grown ass man in Sergey Kovalev, though. His ass will go fight the young guy who's only had twelve fights. That right there tells me he's not the number two guy in the world. The number two guy in the world would want to fight the number one guy in the world. Barrera knows he's not that good. I think Bavol <laughs> takes him out. I think he takes him out fairly easy. And I'm not sold on Bavol yet. 
No, I think I think you're I think you're underestimating Pereira. Now he is thirty six no, years no, old. No, because but... I've just watched that this man had a chance to be the man, and he decided, nah. There's something wrong with that. I, I do mean, think there's something wrong with that. I have a problem with that as well. But yeah, so I don't how think can you rank him number two? Pitfall. How would you rank him two if he's afraid to fight number one? Because that's 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 where he is ability wise and performance wise. But, I don't uh, see it. I, I mean, who I, is he beaten uh, to put him ahead of Badu Jack? I mean, and, is George and I Groves him, trash? George Groves, uh, uh, at this level, is not a particularly special fighter. Okay. No, well, not. who is Barrera beat that's a special fighter? Barrera has beaten dangerous fighters like an undefe- undefeated Shabransky. Joe Smith, who only had one loss, who was coming off two huge knockouts, who's a, who's a murderous puncher. Yeah, uh, and he's been in there with and he's been in there with Andre Ward, who at the time of his retirement was clearly the best fighter in the sport. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I was I, in the I, ring with Muhammad Ali. It didn't make him well, any better. Well, I mean, I, I, w- I would agree that I would agree that Andre Ward is the best opponent between either guy. Well, yeah. But if you look at what Badu, if you look at what Badu Jack has done, I mean, most people saw him beating James DeGale, who you know, and they were number one and number two at one sixty eight, and he also beat George Groves. I thought clear enough, and you know, George Groves is now the number one one hundred sixty eight pounder in the world. I mean, is Joe Smith an obviously better fighter than uh, you know DeGale or? George Groves, I'm not convinced of that. And remember, Badu Jack got knocked out by by you know basically a club fighter level fighter. Yeah, he's 34 years old himself. And that was also four or five years ago. And since then, he has beaten Darrell Groves, Butte, DeGal, cleverly. I mean, cleverly, (laughs) clever, clever, cleverly. Okay, he didn't beat cleverly. Have you seen cleverly, then. I'm sorry. Have you seen cleverly? Have you seen cleverly fight? No, I don't know shit. The only thing I do know is this: I read off the people he'd beaten since he lost to Derek Edwards. I never once said Nathan Cleverly was impressive. And Luciano Butte is old, but the point is this: that's what he's done since then. And I mean, I, I don't know why the constant ripping on a guy who has beat the number one hundred and sixty-eight pounder. And is going like up to challenge that, the guy that's supposed to be the light heavyweight champion by a lot of people's. When you're going to rate so, somebody ahead of him that's afraid to fight Kovalev. How would bad how how would Badu Jack do against Kovalev? He'd get knocked he, he out. Wouldn't, he wouldn't last. Three, he wouldn't last three rounds. Yeah, the same thing Barrera would do. Barrera would have a chance to win the fight. No, he wouldn't. He would have no chance. You also told me Shabransky had a chance. And Shabransky got blown out in what two rounds? Yeah, and I, I also said there was there was a risk that he would get uh, blown out early. If, and I said he'd have to survive the trouble early, but obviously he didn't. But he also took a bad beating from Barrera before that when he was undefeated. Oh, okay, well I know there's always an excuse, but I, I don't think that anybody in their right mind thinks Sullivan Barrera can beat him because you know what Sullivan Barrera won't even fight him. And that was Sullivan Barrera's choice. So ask Sullivan Barrera if he thinks he can beat Sergey Kovalev. Why would you turn down more money and a chance to beat a light heavyweight champion if you thought you could win? He, he obviously thought there was a much less chance he could win against Kovalev, but he obviously was very confident he had a good chance to beat B-Ball. Yeah, that's and I think no that that's worth why looking he at. would be ranked number two then. I mean, why would you want to rank a guy number two that's afraid to fight the guy that's number one? Mike, there, there's the, times la, 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 Larry Larry Holmes didn't want to fight Michael Dokes or Greg Page. It didn't mean that he forfeited his lineal title to Greg Page or Michael what Dokes. What the hell? Larry Holmes was the champion. We're talking about somebody that's not the champion trying to be the champion, not somebody that is the champion that doesn't want to give a payday to an asshole that steals money from him for years. I mean, but, we're talking it, about it, the guy that's it, the champion. But it, you know, it doesn't determine what you, it doesn't determine what your ranking is at that point. It doesn't. He was Larry no. Holmes was the world champion, right? But he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't automatically forfeit the title because he doesn't want to fight Page or Dokes. No, because like he's a world Barrera champion. Those guys but, but, but let me finish. But, 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 but let me finish. Barrera doesn't forfeit his spot as being the number two guy in the world behind Kovalev 
just because he doesn't want to fight Kovalev now. Now, did I agree with his decision? No, I think to be the clear number one guy in the sport for more money, I think he should have taken that fight. But the fact is that he didn't, but it doesn't change what I think his abilities are. Well, it just changes what I think the, you know, makeup of him as a fighter is. Jeremiah, you can jump in. Well, <laughs> well yeah. I, 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 mean, I, I mean, you, you can, but but uh, I think that, you know, he, he believes he can get by B-ball, and he may, if he if he gets by him, who knows, maybe, maybe Kovalev will be next for him. Well, it's been rumored. Now, I would have liked to have seen him take the Kovalev fight. I thought that would have been a great one versus two matchup. I would have viewed it in my original eight rankings. I would have viewed that as for the light heavyweight championship. That's why I was disappointed not to see. But I think okay. that uh, Brera obviously sees something in Bivol he thinks he can exploit. Right. And and so let, let me add a wrinkle here. I mean, am I mistaken or is Barrera, Bivol, and Kovalev, are they all under the main events promotional banner? Uh, Bivol has a deal now with uh, main events where they're going to be his U.S. his U.S. like liaison promoter. Okay, so and so, so and Kovalev are straight out with their Barrera and Kovalev are straight out with main events. Okay, so so it, it's a bit like uh, Top Rank and Jeff Horn and Joseph Parker because that's the deal that Aram has with those two if they fight stateside. Right. So so right. To to Barrera's defense, maybe it it is like a main events maneuvering where they'll they'll have them fight for a trinket and then they can unify down the line, maybe so. But I, I do think it, I, I do agree that it is upsetting that Barrera didn't want to fight the best guy available to him because he has shown, uh, you know, up until this point, a wanting to fight the very best in the division. Uh, but I'm, but you know, still back to the Badu Jack thing. You know, you lo- you look at Joe Smith Jr. and you look at Shabransky. I- I'm not quite sure I see that collectively as better than than Cleverly and Darrell and DeGale and and Groves. I'm I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced of that one. Remember, we're talking about fighting at light heavyweight as well. And, you know, 168 would just be in the light heavyweight division uh, if there were only eight divisions or nine divisions. Um, And, you know, if if Fadu Jack was fighting against light heavyweight competition outside of Nathan Cleverly, uh, he probably would have suffered uh, additional knockout defeats uh, to me at this point. Okay. Yeah. Based off of what? Because he got upset by Derek Edwards? He got dropped by DeGale. Um, oh, my God. Really? I mean, you're you're comparing that to a guy that's been dropped four of his last five fights. Right, but he hasn't But he hasn't been knocked out by a journeyman. Oh, okay. I understand. Well, I mean, I, I think that that's why Adonis Stevenson is picking Badu Jack to fight, because he's picking opponents whose chin he knows he can reach and exploit, and he sees that in Badu Jack, and I agree with him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so does Badu Jack even make the top 10 of the light heavyweight division? I think I had him at about uh, 10. 10. And who do you have above him? I'll see. I, I Without look, looking right at my last ratings, I have uh, the championship uh, vacant. I have uh, Kovalev 1 and Barrera 2. I believe I have uh, Stevenson 3rd. I think I had Gavodstick 4th. Uh, I think I had uh, Beater BF fifth. Uh, I think then, uh, let's see, I might have had uh, Alvarez, Alvarez in there somewhere. I've still got uh, Joe Smith in there. Um, and let's see, who else? Uh, Joe Smith just got like a win over a really old Bernard Hopkins. And he knocked Von Farrow out in the first round. Well, everybody knocks Von Farrow out in the first round in the last few years. Well, at the time Joe Smith knocked him out, it was it was a huge upset. Uh, Von Farrow was, you know, a top ten guy at that point. Uh, so you know he has to he has to get uh, he has to get credit he has to get credit for that. Uh, Marcus Brown, I've got in there. Um, I've got him ahead of Badu Jack. Yeah, and Marcus hadn't beat anybody yet. And I love Marcus. I think Marcus is a top five guy, but I wouldn't rank him there because he doesn't deserve it yet. Well, I think, uh, you know, I think he's got the ability. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, because I I think that you have to look 
to a degree at who somebody has uh, beaten in division, but I do see some people in their rankings, in my opinion, that get carried away uh, with it. Uh, for example, you know, when, when you've got a like, you know, that that's one fault I do have with the transnational ratings on a couple guys. And there's some guys I have that problem with in the ring ratings, but uh you know, transnational filled in Badu Jacket like number three because he knocked out Nathan Cleverly. You know, Nathan Cleverly had Brammer retire against him with an arm injury. Nathan Cleverly had come off a loss to Fonfara, uh, you know, and then Joe Smith knocked Fonfara out in a round. Uh, you know, so so we got Nathan, you know, how, how does Badu Jack somehow come in at number three at light heavyweight? You, you know, that's, that's like Tony Bellew beats David Hay and he's number 10 at heavyweight in other words I think I have to look at my ratings anybody who's doing a ratings you have to look at and you know Jeremiah of course is on the transnational panel which I totally believe in what they're doing do a great job overall but I think what what I would advocate that you've got to look at is uh, sometimes you've got to look at that your own rating might have been wrong for example uh, if if I had Nathan, if I had Nathan cleverly number three and Badu Jack annihilates him like that, sometimes I got to look at it and say, you know, I think maybe Nathan cleverly wasn't as good as I thought he was. Uh, and then you know you you put Badu Jack in there, but you don't put him right in the spot cleverly was. Uh, you know, in other words, I think you've got to when you're doing ratings, there there's certain performances you you when you see them, you've got to. Uh, look at him and say, I might have been wrong about how high I had this guy rated. Same for pound for pound ratings. You don't automatically sometimes re, just replace the guy who, who beats the guy and say he takes that spot in the rankings. I mean, if, if it's a great fight and they both perform extremely well, you might do that, but not when you look at it and then somebody turned out to be overrated. Right. You know, no, and I, I agree. And, I, and you see that uh, again, you know, the transnational itself is full of a lot of panel members and a lot of them have a variety of input and we know how subjective boxing can be. But the thing, if, if I'm not mistaken about the, the whole Badu Jack thing, I, I don't think I was on the panel at the time. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but if I'm not mistaken, Jurgen Brammer, because of his longevity, was a top five light heavyweight and cleverly did score the win. I know it was an injury stoppage, but you know he still got the win. Therefore, cleverly was was fairly highly ranked. And you know, again, Badu Jack are in most people's eyes beating the number one one hundred and sixty eight pounder. And then you look at the landscape at one seventy five, and I know we we all agree that one seventy five is a a good division. Uh, but when you look at, I mean, when we're looking at the landscape at 175, Arthur Beter Biev's best win is what Coling? I mean, uh, I mean, is it really that crazy to have Badu Jack above Coling? I don't even think it's crazy to have him above Sullivan Barrera, who, again, I think it's arguable that, uh, you know, we as we've been talking about that, uh, Badu Jack's all his his resume as a whole is better than Sullivan Barrera's. You know, so I, again, I, I don't see it. I mean, Bivol, what, he gets to jump into the top 10 because he knocks out Trent Broadhurst? I mean, yeah, 175-pounder, you know, it, it, a lot of these guys look talented, but a lot of them are lacking resume. Marcus Brown, you know, uh, it, name any of these guys. I mean, none of them have really, besides Sergey Kovalev, none of them are really beaten uh, that great of competition. Yeah, and I think the That's light right. heavyweight I do have B ball overrated. I do have B I do have B ball in my top ten as well. He's in the bottom half of my top ten. But I but think you he's got him ahead of I don't think it's over. Yes, I have him ahead of Badu Jack. I think he'd knock out but Okay. I think he'd knock out Badu. No, it's because I think he'd knock out Badu Jack. Well okay. it, I'm it, I mean and this is completely this, this confident is, of that. This is going to happen. I mean, this is going to happen in rankings. I mean, a lot, you know, it, it, there is certain weight you got to give to criteria, but I think in general, we agree that what you actually do yeah. is more important than what you could do. I mean, you could have all the talent in the world, but the application of that talent is what's most important. And even though Badu Jack, is, I, I'm not even that big of a fan of Badu, Badu Jack, even though I am pulling for him against Stevenson because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit tired of the way that he's been doing things. Uh, you know, he, the proof is kind of in the pudding. I mean, lately he's been, he's looked pretty damn good in his recent outing since the knockout to Derek Edwards. Uh, but you know, transnational, even recently, we, you know, there are like Artem Delakian, for instance, we moved him all the way to number six, 
uh, just over a win against the number 10, Brian Valoria. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a pretty sizable jump. Well, you look at the guys from number five, you, you know, uh, Brian or uh, Donnie Nietzsche's, he beats uh, Ravev, Ravevko, I, I forget how you say his name, who I think was number four at the time. He looks long in the, the tooth. He gets pushed back. But you look at the, the resumes of the guy from five through six, and none of them have a win as good as, uh, Brian Valoria recently. So, you know, that's part of the reason he made the jump there. So it, there's a lot of input there. And again, certain people put certain amount of weight on, on different criteria, but still, I, I think we generally agree that what you do is more important than what it looks like you can do. And you might want to know too, that um, on five dimes, Donna Stevenson is a minus 175 favorite over Badu Jack for May 19th. Okay. It's not a very big favorite. No, it's almost even money. But uh, considering Stevenson Stevenson's age uh, and his lack of opposition over recent years, uh, it tells you that uh, there's the odds makers are uh, not utterly sold on the do jack. All right. Okay. All right. Um, where would you have Stevenson ranked, by the way? Uh, I, I I have him at three because I think that he... Okay. Uh, so the odds makers yeah, just, who have an in and know things have him pretty much even money with the number three guy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move on real quick because we're getting close to an hour and i got to get to bed at some point. We all know I won't, <laughs> but I, I need to. Um, we're going to touch on Wilder Ortiz. We did the show earlier in the week with Lou Savarese. Um, but Jeremiah didn't get to do the show because he was hooking that night. Um, <laughs> family <laughs> East Colfax. That's the, uh, if, if, if any of you are locals and you, you know, you, you want to get in touch East Colfax is where I'll be. I'll be near downtown. Uh, uh you know, I'll be wearing a bright red shirt. Just uh, flag credit down. cards too. That's true. And PayPal. <laughs> yeah, you just but... swipe it, swipe it through the ass crack and we're good to go. <laughs> Are you talking about the credit card? It doesn't matter. You All know, right, I just, let's uh... get off this real quick. This is deteriorating like our regular phone conversations do when nobody else can hear. They can hear <laughs> now, and it's being recorded, so we got to stop. Um, all right. Uh, Wilder weighed in today at 214 pounds. Ortiz, 241. Um, Jeremiah, we have not gotten your take on this fight yet, so we will let you go first. All right. Well, I I definitely think the weight the weight is an interesting factor. I mean, Wilder coming in at two fourteen, I think what it tells me is that he's going to have his boxing shoes on. He's going to use a lateral ladder movement. He's going to stick behind the jab, uh, and then in the late rounds he'll probably try to apply his power a little bit more. Of course, I'm uncertain of that, but what it shows me is from both guys' weight that they're taking this fight seriously, and I like to see that. Whenever you see two heavyweights who look like they're in, you know, an Ortiz's uh, you know, if, if you're looking at Ortiz in fairly good condition, uh, but Wilder's ripped. I mean, he looks thin. He looks ready to go. Uh, you know, I think that'll probably help his stamina a bit, but that, that's kind of what I gather from it is, is stylistically Ortiz is going to come forward. And, and I think with the weight, that's what you would want to do. Ortiz being, you know, 241 pounds, sizable weight advantage here. I think he'd just go right after Wilder and he'd try to get him out of there. You rough him up a little bit. I mean, his defense is pretty good. Technically, he's pretty good. Uh, I think it's a real interesting fight, especially since both guys showed up in shape. And especially since Wilder, you know, is showing up in, uh, I can't remember the last time he was 214 pounds. Is, uh, you know, maybe when he first started. I, I don't know. But it's an interesting fight. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm picking Wilder by decision here, uh, you know, or a late stoppage. It's kind of tough for me to say, uh, Ortiz to me just hasn't looked the same since Brian Jennings, but I wouldn't be, ha- I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Ortiz score an upset. You know, technically he looks sharp. It's just hard to say what he's got at this point. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. I think an Ortiz from the night he fought Brian Jennings, I think both of us would pick him to win this fight easily. So I think it's just according to what he's got left, how old he really is. Um, John, I, I know when we had the show before, you talked about his weight and how that would tell you a lot. Um, what did it tell you? I love it. I love it. This is. I, I'm glad that we got to talk about this 
one more time before the fight because it's after today's weigh-in. And Wilder did just what I hoped he would do. He did it even better than I thought. I said, I need to see him at least 219 or 220. If he was heavier than that, I thought he was going to put himself at much more risk of losing. He surprises me and comes in at 214. Uh, I think it's good because, uh, like Jeremiah said, stamina will be better. Uh, he'll be able to box better. I think he can do his Holmes impersonation at that weight, and uh, that's what I like. Don't I think you think maybe good. he uh, should at least win a fight that means something before you compare him to Larry Holmes, especially since Larry no, Holmes I, had great feet, and Wilder looks nothing like Larry Holmes. Now I think that he he's he's a poor he does some of the poor man's Larry Holmes type Jesus. things, and uh, so did Reggie a modern Strickland. version of it. He's got he's got more one punch. Got more one punch power. I think the only risk oh, is a two come on. He's got more the, one punch the only... power. More one punch yeah, power than Larry does. Holmes. I don't think so. Because I watched Larry Holmes lo- knock out legitimate heavyweights. I don't think Berman Stavern would have sit there and taken Larry Holmes' best shots for twelve rounds. And especially when he couldn't knock Stavern down. You can, you see the way people go out against Wilder. It's it's Larry really? Holmes is an underrated right hand puncher, but it's not the same type of thing. Jesus, it's, it's different. I guarantee Wilder. you this: when and, you watch Larry Holmes's fights against guys like Tom Prater and stuff, they went out like that. Not like I mean, this. Not like not okay. like not like the one. Not like the not like the. So kind it doesn't of matter who punch. you're knocking out when you not, do it. I mean, Wilder, it matters, the best still, fighter to Wilder fight was Stavern. He hits the bird yeah, with still, everything he had, still, and he never knocked him there's down. Still, there's still, there's, he knocked him down, Mike. No, he, he didn't. He scored a knockdown. He, he, yes, he did. He scored a knockdown or a I knockout against every opponent I watched the entire fight the other day. There was no, what round did he score a knockdown? It was in the first half of the fight. Okay. So, he scored a knockdown <laughs> or a knockout in uh, every fight that he's had. Oh, uh, and he got knocked Korea. down. And, uh, you know, he's also now stopped everybody's ever fought since he stopped Severn and won in the rematch. Uh, and I, I think the 214, good for, good for his stamina, good for his boxing ability, good for his quickness. Now, you know, he's not going to be uh, wanting to stand there right still with uh, Ortiz, uh, you know, because Ortiz does bring power. Ortiz is still going to be a dangerous opponent. And, uh, you know, one thing, though, you know, Ortiz weighing in at 241, uh, you know, the, he was getting that video of him doing intervals on the track, circulating around the internet, and uh, I don't know, uh, 241. You know, I, I mean, I think he, I think he's in decent shape, but uh, there, this, it's not going to be a, uh, a a different, more su- supremely conditioned uh, Luis Ortiz. I'll, I'll say that, but I think the only risk Wilder runs with the 214. You know, when you look at throughout boxing history, I still like it. But if something went wrong, it would be, you know, maybe he got so hyped up. Could he could he be a little bit overtrained? Uh, I don't I, I still like him being uh, light. So I like it. I'm taking it as a big positive. But I think the only downside of it could be that, you know, in, unless he got so hyped up that he's slightly overtrained. But I, I like it because I think then, you know, he can jab and move and he still keeps the one punch power with him so i like the package of him being under 220 and uh, it also i think like uh, lou savaris mentioned in our show earlier in the week what i also love about it is you know it shows the guy who's taking the fight seriously i mean you're not you know, the only time really that i can remember where a low weight was fake was ali for the homes when he was taking all the diuretics and everybody was saying he looked good and he was like a uh, zombie in there and he couldn't even move he was so drained but under normal circumstances when you see a fighter coming in lighter like that you know they're taking it seriously you know they're in uh, real real good shape yeah well he didn't knock the burn down in the first fight that's obvious he did not he no, did knock the burn down in the first fight Mike. How, where do you get that i mean i watched the because fight he knocked, John the, he knocked him down fight. in the first fight right he didn't have to, knock have him to down watch it again i mean my he did god knock him down. you don't have to lie to make knock a guy it. sound like he's better than what he is i watched all 12 I'm rounds not, of the fight the closest thing was in the second round where Stavern gets hit and he kind of staggers around a little bit and him, Wilder, and Weeks fall into the ropes and it was not scored a knockdown. It was a knockdown. Jesus. I don't know what to say to this. This is mind-blowing to me. I mean, when I sit there and watch the fight yesterday and there was no knockdown. 
There just wasn't. Mike, I you're saying Mike, you're saying that Wilder got knocked out by Harold Sconier, so Oh he know, didn't? I mean he didn't get knocked down by him? He didn't get knocked out by Harold Sconiers. He didn't get knocked down? No, he, no, no. He John get, John's he, saying he didn't get knocked out. No. He didn't get knocked John's, out. Yeah, John's saying knocked out. But regardless, I mean, you know, there's still a lot of question marks surrounding both guys. I mean, we, we've got a guy in Deontay Wilder who has 39 fights, and this is his second. I mean, uh, I, I'm not quite sure I'd have to take, it the, take a look at the ring's ratings. Uh, I'm not sure if they have Luis Ortiz rated still. Uh, you know, I, I'm just unsure of that. But, but they took him, the, the ring, the ring uh, took him out of their ratings. Okay, so yeah, transnational and the ring took him out. So technically, I, I took him out as well. I I took him out as well because of the two PED positive tests. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and Ortiz, he he messed himself up with that. He didn't for, file the the proper paperwork. You know, even if he really w- did need the medication, he he just didn't go through the proper proper channels. And, uh, you know, I've heard in some uh, places that maybe he was using it to mask the PED use. I'm not exactly sure. But what I do know is for this fight, he's been tested a good number of times by VADA. Everything seems free and clear so far. Uh, you know, so so we'll see how he shows up on, on fight night. You know, if, if Wilder wins, technically this isn't a, a win over a top 10 guy. But, you know, in terms of talent, it is. So uh, I'm looking forward to the fight because, you know, I really want to see that there are just a lot of question marks surrounding both guys. I mean, Brian Jennings was a good fighter, but, you know, it doesn't answer all the questions we needed to. Wilder, obviously, with his opposition, we just got to read a lot into that. I'm just excited for the fight. I mean, it's a big heavyweight matchup. And, uh, you know, again, hopefully we'll get those questions answered. All right. Yeah, um, I mean, I do agree that it, it, the fight has lost a little bit for me in terms of Ortiz's two PED tests. Uh, but I, since the fight is coming off, he's still dangerous on talent. You know, he's got he's got top three talent, so it's still going to since the fight's coming off, it's still uh, going to be an interesting test for Wild and an interesting fight. Okay. Um... So your pick, Jeremiah, is water by unanimous decision? I'm going to pick him late knockout. All right. And John? Uh, I, I, you know, it, for me, it's either it's either decision or, uh, or you know, a uh, late stoppage as well. Um, I, I'm uh, – you know, I'm I'm leaning I'm leaning more towards a I'm leaning a little more towards a decision here. Uh, you know, that at, at the two fourteen that Wilder will just be able to uh, outbox him and keep 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 hitting him with the one two. But uh, I think a, a late I think a stoppage is also you know a possibility in this one. Yeah, I, I like Ortiz if he hasn't gotten old. If he's the Ortiz of three years ago, I think Ortiz knocks him out. If he's not, I think Wilder wins the fight in a boring decision. Yeah, I think I think Ortiz. You know, he, he brings enough power. He's going to be he's going to be dangerous. So, uh, you know, I I always felt that this was a winnable fight for Wilder even before the uh, Ortiz most recent PED incident. But uh, I thought that you know Ortiz would would bring danger and. I think you have to, you know, whether you you like Wilder or you don't like Wilder, you, you got to give him some degree of credit for, uh, you know, take, taking the fight with with a guy that uh, you know, does, does bring this uh, does bring this level of danger. But there's, you know, there's no evidence that he's. Hey, he's we got to take what we can get, Mike. Well, he's at least thirty eight. I mean, well, we we got to take what we can get right. here. Yeah, well, yeah, we got to thirty eight. I mean, that's well, we gotta, at least thirty eight. Well, with yeah, with the heavyweight division as it is, though, we've we've got to take a week. Oh can no, get, I'm not complaining. I'm just complaining because I'd rather see Pavetkin fight. Yeah, well, and the sad thing is he's in his late 30s too. So you know, yeah, the heavyweight know. division's not really looking all that special. But you know, you know, I think uh, Eddie Hearn and and uh, you know Josh were going to be rooting for Wilder as well because you know if Ortiz wins that fight, I you know I just don't think they can make enough money off an Ortiz unification. Uh, like they they can a wilder one, you know, just a whole big, you know, America versus, uh, you know, the Brit, you know, Brits, it, it, you know, that that just it has it has a selling point to it, you know, an elder Cuban. I'm just not quite sure it's got the same punch. 
No, but I don't think that that fight's ever going to sell unless we can get something here. And my, my problem is this. If you're going to claim Wilder's that good and he's that big of a puncher, if you think Ortiz is going to distance with him, I don't see how you can think he's that big of a puncher, especially a 38-year-old Ortiz. I, it's because uh, it be, it's because of being smart and what risk you want to take. You know what what's the safest uh, route to win the fight, and uh, you know it, even though Wilder is a very good puncher, you know Ortiz also punches well, and uh, Wilder just has some other attributes uh, that he can go with with uh, being in a position to be quicker and uh, have better stamina. Yeah, I, I was telling you, if Ortiz has anything, he wins this fight. I mean, it's just there's nobody with as bad a footwork as Deontay Wilder that's boxing today. Not even Badu Jack. Right, but why, I think that Wilder moved well in the, the first fight with uh, with Stavern. Yeah, and Stavern gave him all kind of trouble. Stavern hit him a lot, and Stavern is not a big puncher, and he couldn't knock Stavern down in the first fight. And I'm reading everything I can about this fight. I can't find a knockdown. I can find where he where they tripped and went down with referee Tony Weeks, um, but I don't see anything where he knocks the burn down and he hits the burn with everything he had. And Stavern landed a uh, lot I of th- punches on him, and Stavern won two or three rounds. It's not like it was a shutout. No, he might have. You know, he he he, he Wilder dominated the fight. You know, uh, you know, I think that it was obvious that Stavern went down. You know, fr- from a punch uh, when he went down. Um, and I, you know, I think that uh, Wilder, you know, he showed a good. You know, I think he Stavern can punch. Stavern now, here, has good here's the other thing, skill. real quick. Have you seen that fight recently? Yeah, I've seen the fight recently. Because the interesting yeah, I mean, I, thing I, about that fight that went the distance and he didn't knock him down is you cannot find that fight on YouTube either. The only version you can find of it is somebody who was sitting up in the crowd that videotaped it. Because that's we watched oh, a handheld camera guy hold the camera up there and videotape the fight that way. That's how I watched the fight the other day because there's nothing on YouTube with it. Well, maybe uh, Showtime just wanted to protect their uh, rights because they're a premium channel. Yeah, that's probably what it is, even though you can go find all their other fights on there. I mean, you can find every other Wilder fight on there. You can find Wilder Stavern 2 on there. I mean, Showtime has their own boxing channel where they put the fights on it. So I don't know how they wouldn't be protecting their rights there, because HBO does too, and you can see their most recent fights on there. Hell, you can go on the cable and go to the thing and find that. But, all right, guys, we will be live tomorrow night. And the other thing that I worry about is this. With all the money tied up in Joshua Wilder, I just hope that nothing strange happens where the first time Ortiz gets cracked, they stop the fight also. Yeah, like Carl- <clears throat> Carlos to calm stoppage. Yeah. And the same thing for Parker Joshua. Because I don't think Parker's as bad as John does, and I think Parker can go to distance. And it's not like I have a high... I I think Josh was definitely worlds better than Deontay Wilder, but I don't think that he's so good that he couldn't be bored to death and upset by Parker. But it would surprise me if he got a decision in that case. I don't think uh, think Joshua has any problem with Parker. I think the odds reflect it, and I think Joshua blows him out. Well, the odds reflect Sullivan Barrera is going to get the shit kicked out of him, and you disagreed with that. They do, and I don't... The odds makers know what they're talking about when they agree with you is the way I take this, and when they don't agree with you, then you just ignore it. No, I don't ignore it. I, I said they know what they're talking about. I've said it consistently. I said that when you make an upset pick, you have to be very careful because if you don't have inside information you're going to be at highly risk at a high risk of being wrong compared to the odds makers but i think there's enough information on this one that uh, i can make the call on the upset and if you can't make an upset call once in a while uh in the right spot where you're using logic then there's no sense making picks because we can just look at the odds but you have to look at the odds and you can't ignore them well Sullivan and Burr is probably getting starts pretty quick tomorrow night so I think the odds makers are right on this one. I don't see him doing anything because I haven't seen him do anything other than go to distance with Andre Ward. Uh, We will be live tomorrow night after these fights. Um, 
probably 15 minutes after the final fight will be live. So you can come to thegruelingcrew.net and check that out. Um, any final words, John? I just we're, we're gonna you know find out uh, find out what happens tomorrow. But uh, I like I like Wilder's weight, and uh, I think Sullivan Barrera, if he uh, the 36 years old doesn't catch up with him tomorrow night, I think that he's. Uh, He's got a good chance for an upset over uh, B-Ball. So these fights are pretty much the same. If the old guy is not too old, he's probably going to win the fight. But we're considering that the guy probably is. Because I really, with Ortiz and Wilder, I think Ortiz is too old too. And I think that both of these fights, if these guys were three years younger, would probably be completely different. Well, we'll see. I don't know if that's going to be the case with Barrera or not. I, I think that uh, Wilder... Well, I, I don't know if it's uh, the case with Ortiz either, but we're going to find out. No, I think that Wilder, 214, this is this is when he's at his best under 220, and uh, I think that uh, he'll be able to perform like he did in the first Deverne fight, which would be uh, a lot of trouble for anybody That would be uh, epic. I mean, that there. would make him similar to Joe Lewis, Larry Holmes, and Muhammad Ali if he can pull that off. Uh, I'm just saying this, Luis Ortiz is even older than Sullivan Barrera. So the way I look at this is, when I've said this in the past, and you said, oh, you're already making an excuse, you made that excuse there for Sullivan Barrera. I don't know why it can't be an excuse for a guy that's almost 40 years old. It could can, it can, it can be a factor, but uh, it's less of a factor at heavyweight than it is at light heavyweight. Okay. Um, Jeremiah, any final words? Yeah, I just wanted to point out real quick that Lewis Neary, the bantamweight, he showed up five pounds oh. overweight against Shinsuke Yamanaka. Uh, this after a uh, positive pet test in the first fight, which, uh, you know, he blamed on tainted beef. It seems like, uh, you know, that happens a lot with the Mexican fighters. Uh, he's been suspended indefinitely by... Uh, some alphabet organization that sanctioned the fight. Uh, I, you, you hate seeing that sort of stuff. They went through with the fight. He ended up scoring a dominant second round knockout. Uh, I just wanted to say that that's bull crap. And, uh, um, you know, I wish Yamanaka well in retirement. Yeah, why wasn't he suspended before the fight? Makes no sense to suspend him after the fight. He should have been suspended before the fight. It should have never happened. It's because the WBC, they're biased towards Mexicans. I mean, we saw this with uh, who? Burchelt. I think Burchelt had a positive test, and and it was the same thing where they blamed it on tainted beef. It's just, you know, over and over and over, uh, you know, in the WBC. If if they're going to do this, if they're going to have this, you know, quote-unquote clean boxing program, they need to stick to their guns and, and stop doing this nonsense. All it's right. Ridiculous. Uh, yeah, well, a lot of things in boxing are ridiculous. Um, it's true. It's boxing. Um, well, all right, true. guys. Remember, catch us live tomorrow night after Wilder Ortiz. You can catch all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for John Einreinhofer, Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak. <laughs>